camera thing here. Good to see everybody. Welcome to the show. I have no hair if you're new. Um, if you're old, you already knew that. Uh, yeah, there's a Blue Jay trying to build up the courage to come and land and grab a nut. We will keep you updated as to the progress that he has. And uh, yeah, uh, good to see everybody. Welcome Rockers, Rock Finneys, and uh, all that all that transpire. We just make sure that the audio is good. Definitely not muted, so that's good. All right. Um, uh, first of all, shout out to uh, to the birthday girl today. My Aunt Sue uh, was born on this day. And some of you guys uh, and gals know her. And uh, so you already know what it's like when I say I'm glad she was born. I'm very glad that she's born. And I uh, hope she has a beautiful day. It's right there. It's right there. You don't need to keep yelling. Jeez. Jeez, you give a guy a bird a peanut and he freaks out on you. Just freaks out. Let me see if we can get the, uh, the slides going today. Uh, let's see. Slides. I just gotta click this button. And then after I click this, whoa, whoa, I click this, I click this button here. And then there we go. All right. Let's get this show on the road. You know, there was a time when we didn't have roads. And we were just fine. We weren't like freaking out, like, oh my god, we. We have to obliterate all liberties so we can have roads. Like, that was never. Seriously, no one was freaking that much out about the fact we didn't have roads. You understand that, guys, right? I know you, maybe I'm preaching the choir here, but we're aware of that, right? That before we have roads, things were okay. It really wasn't that that huge of a horrible place we had here, you know? In fact, there's a little bit of mystery to it. There's a little bit of fun, a little bit of rambunctiousness. But now what do you got? You got Stuckies. That's about the most exciting place that you're going to find is the Stuckies, right? It's about the, the most uh, <clears throat> salacious thing that you can find on the road today is the Stuckies. And uh, ask yourself. Ask your grandparents. Ask your parents. Is it worth it? Is this really what we were after? Was it really that important that... Now, the most salacious thing we have is a Stuckies. Mm. It's good to see you guys. I've been reading a lot. I uh, Someone mentioned, why are you not <clears throat> doing a show? And I was offended because I did a show Monday. And uh, um, I actually wasn't offended, but uh, uh, I've only done two, two shows a week lately. And most of that is due to research. Uh, sometimes you just you can't really find like a good point to be like, I will present this now because you, you're finding out, wait a minute, I don't want to present this yet because I want to see where this goes. And so you kind of, uh, well, thank you, Charlotte. Uh, you kind of uh, uh, don't want to say something that's going to com be completely wrong when you round the next corner. It's a tricky bit. Um, and I've been doing a lot of uh, reading. And uh, so I've actually been here. Um I, I've, I've been I've been probably working more than than I have in a while, but it's all been research oriented. In fact, it, it could end up turning into a book. <clears throat> uh, we'll see. It, it, it uh, so there's there's two different paths when you want to explain something. One is that you can scientifically just kind of explain stuff. Another is maybe to narrate it in a literary way. So you still you know this is the power of science fiction you all know that probably the most famous science fiction story we we know probably is sputnik and the ability for that story to salaciously uh insert itself into the mind it literally became real because it was that appealing and wh what really made it appealing was how believable it was how easy it was for for us to fall to slip into the storyline of Sputnik, of the space race. And I want to remind you that <clears throat> 10 years prior to Sputnik, the War of the Worlds radio show came out. And that radio show 
didn't actually uh, wasn't actually that much different than Sputnik. The only real difference between the radio show and Sputnik was at the beginning of the World Awards, there was a disclaimer that told you what you were listening to. Sputnik didn't have that. And that tiny, tiny thing that was removed showcased the, the real truth of who they are. And if anyone's in our tribe, meaning you're subscribed to Dojo or you attend Dojo or you're a witness on JTrue, you, you, you probably have maybe saw that our last Dojo on Wednesday was five hours long. Normally our Dojo's are an hour and a half. And I believe that three and a half of those hours were dedicated to this problem we have with the definition of who they are. Because they is us. And they is in the room everywhere you are because you are a contributing factor to us and that anyone in denial of being us has no choice but to insist that us is they. Do you follow? That, that becomes crucial if you're going to survive is to have that kind of... Uh, um, pressure relief valve, really, which is just denial. It's just denial. That's all. Yes, I am they. They is the lack of you wanting a road. They is all of us collectively saying, someone should do something. They is all of us saying, think of the children. They is all of us bitching about how horrible the schools are as we put our kids on the bus to school. That's they. And we know who they is. They is us. And uh, the first person that's going to burn you at the stake for being a witch is the person that hears you say, Hey man, I think we are they. You'll be the first one to go. And I want you to know, I'll be right next to you with a bag of marshmallows. I keep them just for this purpose. Hey, there's Sue. Good. I was hoping maybe she wanted to hear that. Yeah, happy, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you, sings the Anunnaki guy. Happy birthday, dear Sue. This guy talking to you would be crazy if you wouldn't have been there too. Yeah, right on. All right, I want to talk about the Christ before Jesus. Actually, there's. it's hard to even label this show. Uh, I don't know how to even do it, to be honest. And it's going to get vulgar, as you can see from the first thing. Sue, I don't know if you want to be offended by all these vulgar images I'm showing on your birthday after announcing it was your birthday. I just want you to know that's what happens when you know me. You're going to get a birthday shout-out on a day, and we could be talking about penises and vaginas all day, and this just happens to be what it is, okay? So, sorry, there's no planning in that at all. But I want people to, to hearken back to those beautiful times before Rhodes when you and I were like, hey, maybe we should worship our genitals. And someone else was like, man, that's a great idea. I, I really like this worshiping of genitals. And all of us were basically living in a town where we just worship genitals all the time. And in the town square, we had a giant phallus. And in May, we would strap streamers to the end of that phallus and wrap the ropes around them. And then generally, it would kind of turn us on. And then we'd end up having sex in the, in the grass. Do you know why? Because there wasn't a road there to make us feel uncomfortable. It was just grass. It was just field. There was no veins variegating the, the place from civilization to savageness, right? None of that was there. And in that time, we had a much different idea of what God is. We understood that God was the ability, nay, the uh, uh, power to embrace uh, infinity. I, I wish that this too would go away in the lower... There. Um, I think it's because my mouse was over it. And, and what you're looking at, these uh, on the left, uh, is not just me trying to be vulgar. Um... The, the, vulgar is even a fascinating word. We might have to have a conversation about that. But these are actual stones that were removed from churches 
were moved from churches because someone said, someone should do something. And someone else was like, yeah, we've got roads now. We can't be having these stones that have all these uh, crazy uh, orifice worshiping uh, idols on our churches. And so a lot of these were torn down. Most of these were torn down. Most of these were ruined. And I'm sure most of you know that Rome has like a just a huge, huge issue. Uh, I mean, lack of issue, I should say, with the penis. And uh, it was just like you do want you want to crack a balls with that, and the guy's like, yeah, sure, why not? And it's like you know, there's a cake decorator. And it's like, yeah, what does your wife want on her birthday cake? It's like, you know, I think I'd like to get her just like a simple cake. She's she's you know, she she has this unfettered elegance that still has this strange timidity to it so i just like a simple cock and balls cake uh with an orifice stargate in the center between the balls maybe with some rose petals right maybe some almond garnish do you think that's too much uh, no no you could do almond garnish yeah yeah i think i think she'd like that hey what the hell we don't have roads right this this was a big uh, big difference in our world. Bigger than I think you might think. There's no pun intended here. But bigger than you might think. That literally saturating every single... Just like you drive around now and you really can't avoid seeing a cross, you were going to see a penis and you were going to see one of these orifices. It's just the way it was. And there's this fascinating book I've been telling you guys about, this Wally character, The Rise, Fall, and Decline of Roman Religion. I highly recommend it. It's free right now on Google Books. And he describes that the origin of the Ark of the Covenant um, really was more intrinsically tied in than we could ever imagine to this regenerative worship, the three-in-one God, right? The divine banana hammock in the sky. And that the box that this is placed in is the Ark, is the Stargate, Right? The female genitals, and placed inside that ark is the rod of Aaron and his two stones. The two stones. And that the rod and the two stones makes what? The three in one God, the triune God, rose out of the ark as a phallus. Now, I would assume that if anyone, uh, is listening to this who has a hard time accepting anything pagan as being built into the base of astrotheology that you might be freaking out right now. Hearing me refer to the cock and balls as the Trinity. And I only can tell you that um, I understand how, how it might feel uncomfortable to you and that that uncomfort that you feel if you could make it through this show, it's only going to get worse. It's only going to go downhill from here for you. And that if you can uh, accept that vitriol and really hang ten and, and really stick it out, you're going to find that the deepest truth, the Petra of your belief system and mine is going to be rooted in this regenerative Worship To worship the regenerative nature of man is to touch as close as you can to God. And that's how we saw this. And that this was probably more reverent than any of the torque you might find in your modern day church right now. Because it was torquing the belief. And those beliefs were being stimulated by these poles by these rods of Aaron. If you don't believe me, you should read Richard Payne Knight's uh, and Thomas Wright's book, Two Essays on the Worship of Priapus. If you saw my episode on Monday, you saw that how this Yahweh God emerged from the sea itself, kind of like a Cthulhu Kraken. If a Cthulhu and a Kraken had a, a bastard child, it would be a cock rooster head with serpent feet, and that that is the origin and base of the Priapus. 
and that most of the research that's been done on this stuff has been deemed pornographic, therefore removed from any standard library where you can find it. I stumbled across this because this, uh, this dude, this uh, wanny dude, uh, the rise, decline, and fall of Roman religion, uh, it could be that maybe uh, someone might even post a link to that in the chat because um, I don't have the slide up right now with his last name and it's kind of a, it's a three-part name. But anyway, had it not been for him, I, I probably wouldn't have even noticed just how prevalent the Priapus was. And that most of the worship of this religion was based on the symbolism of the genitalia and the reproductive nature of it. And putting wings on penises was not that out of the ordinary. In fact, a cache of 4,000 buried phallus, psi, phalluses, were recently found in Rome. Hi, will you accept long-distance charges? Yes, honey, it's me calling from our archaeological dig. I just wanted to celebrate the good news. What is it, honey? What is it? Honey, today we found 4,000 buried phalluses in the ground. In this ancient Roman dig we were telling you about, 4,000 of them. Oh, my, honey, that's really impressive. Yeah, it is. It is, honey. This is going to really, really make me out my career you know, uncovering these phallusi. Is it phallusi, honey? Is that, yeah, I think phallusi works. Well, you know, uncovering these. And that, that conversation not only happened, but it was quickly forgotten. That the 4,000 cash of phallusi in Rome isn't even like an odd number. The, the streets were littered in dicks. Littered. Everywhere you went. Right? No different than spam now. No different than um, all of the church signs that you might see, and more importantly, all of the political signs you might see, because back then those were the same. So the same essence, the Trinity, the Trinity before the Trinity. See where this is going? Of course, I already blew this on Monday, but let me say it again if you missed it, that even stories like Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water, Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. That, that this, this idea of climbing to the top of the hill to drink actually comes to the, the notion of having cloistered whores inside your keep, and you just call your keep a church. Your swear engine of dead wood, and you've got the gem mine, and you simply decide to call it a church one day. And that this was really at the heart and base of community. Remember that expression, what is the oldest profession? Is prostitution. Well, the oldest profession is religious prostitution. That's the oldest profession. And you see these stories hidden. Look inside 1 Samuel 9, 11. And as they went upon the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water, and said unto them, Is the seer here? Is the seer here? Is the one-eyed man here? They asked the maiden. And atop that water, what was waiting for them? Syphilis. And these people considered syphilis a religious persecution. This syphilis was a living God that was expressing its displeasure with either the person performing or the person receiving, the up, the top, the bottom, that even if Jack lost his crown, it wouldn't matter because Jill would be tumbling after. I just found out last night as I was prepping these slides that, that the origin of Jack and Jill used to be Jack and Gill. It's a German origin to that, and it was two guys that were going up the hill to fetch the cloistered water. And you understand that none itself uh, is related to the uh, cleansing fallow period during Pisces, where the nuns were laid fallow. And I hope that you can understand that finding a virgin 
would be a definition of ecstasy when you're living in a world that has no roads. This would be your Mecca because it would be syphilis-free, or so you think it would be, right? Most of your syphilis cases were seen as demonic attacks. Those same syphilis cases developed into smallpox. The smallpox was also considered a de demonic attack. It was considered so much a demonic attack that we decided to take the pus of bovines, of bowel, to take the devil's poison itself, right? Vaccine is from cow and to take the pus of cow and insert it into our sickness to feel better. That all of these intrinsic medicines have been based on this act of sex. And more importantly, excuse me, all of the venereal disease that we know as Watiko has a transmissional aspect to it and it occurs through religion through religious prostitution the oldest profession in the world I'd like to introduce you to cacao wait well you didn't see the i had to, you're supposed to be seeing the slide i'd like to introduce you to cacao <laughs> he is phallus son of phallus and if you follow the blue arrow, you'll see the cartouche of cacao that shows you he is the tripled phallus one. The, uh, had this serpentine aspect to himself. And that because Egypt uh, didn't have a separate symbol for R and L, that you end up with this bastardization of Farajo, or Pharaoh as we know the word today, Rising from Falao, Falao, right? Falao, right? There's the cosmic word right now. Fala and O, divine phallus, divine feminine. And that this, this uh, religion didn't go away. It wasn't destroyed. It simply grew. And that every month we were living in a society that had orgies public orgies these monthly anti-modesty fete, day, fete days sorry, when all bonds were loosed and a huge model of the male organ the Hindu pala or phallus was carried in a procession which finally degenerated into extreme licentiousness I know that word I just licentiousness the people indulging in the most infamous vices in full daylight and listen, listen to these, these are great Liberalia, Floralia, hey baby, Lupercalia, holy shit, we're going to get wild tonight, Vulcanalia, oh, pound that hammer, baby, Fornicalia, are you kidding? Let it go, Bacchanalia, right, for Bacchus, Dionasca Maternalia, wow, let's get it on, Hilaria, Priapia, as you know, Priapus, Bonadea, and fascinating, Fascinating that this is on the list. Adonai. And you picture the orgy of, oh God, oh God, oh God. And Adonai rising from that. Rising from that thing. And I, I, I said this last time, forgive me, but even Cato respected, uh, respected the importance of having these uh, exhaust ceremonies exhaust ceremonies where the people were allowed to vent and that instead of venting through piety or someone should do something or the terrorists are coming they vented in let's get it on baby let's go to the town square let's oil up the uh, town rod and let's cleanse ourselves of our sins hard to imagine that one is worse than the other just when you look at at, at how and where we are right now. Let's see, where's my mouse? There we go. 
the Ankh, which of course everyone has a different uh, idea of what the Ankh means, and I'm not trying to change this for anyone, but if you if you really look at at uh, most of the architecture, religious architecture, you kind of see that Ankh would be the horizon. That line that crosses would be the horizon, the intersection of the phallus and the Ark, the rod of Aaron and the Ark, the Ankh. Right, the rod and the almond. Uh, if anyone doesn't know what the almond is, just ask one of the uh, females in the room to send you a picture of her genitalia, and you'll you'll see the almond there. Um, this uh, same trinity, the same idea, right, is seen in the fleur de lis, even the trident of Neptune. Uh, of course, the trisole, the trimorte, and of course, phi itself. Look at even the concept of the finger in the ring, of placing the the phallus into the circle, is how you create the phi or the phi, however you want to pronounce that, and that the ring itself symbolizes this, shows you this this concept. And that the truth of the matter is, is that man used to worship or swear, same thing, on the phallus. All right. All right, uh, James York, five points for that joke in the chat. Uh, uh, I, I won't read that. I'll just let you enjoy the, uh, the wonderful musings of our wandering comic. This is what happens when we don't have roads. We get to laugh at stuff like this. But the, even the swearing of the phallus was uh, a common thing. I can't believe that I even found an illustration that's showing it. It's, it's fantastic. When I saw this, I crack myself up when I find these things. But it's just, there it is. And there's two verses to back it up. Genesis 24, 9, And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master and swear to him concerning this matter. And this is not a, a elusive, symbolic joke. You're not going to be telling. Uh, you're not going to be pulling these stories where you're trying to tell me it was symbolic of something else. Uh, swearing on your loins is still, still today in our culture, a very common thing. Genesis forty-seven twenty-nine. The time drew nigh that Israel must die, and he called his son Joseph and said unto him, Joseph, Joseph, if now. I have found thy grace in thy sight. Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh and touch my member. Touch it nigh, Joseph, and deal kindly and truly with my loin. For bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. And Joseph, responding, But why did I have to put, put, put my hand on your loins? Because it is the tradition of the land with no roads where we will hold each other's phallus and swear allegiance to each other. But but why do we have to do this? Can we just sign like a contract or like a will? There's like a lot of other ways we can stop. You're making it grow, Joseph. You wouldn't want that now, would you? No, no, no. All right. Think about baseball, Joseph. But baseball hasn't been invented yet. Damn it, Joseph. Damn you, Joseph. Damn you. Of course, uh, hey, it did it again. O Ophalos, Omphalos, this is the Om and the Phallos, right? The woman and the man. And it's hilarious that we, uh, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, Omphalos is like the stone of like, they consider it the center of the world, the navel of the world. Two eagles stretched out, flying in opposite directions to find the center point of the world where they meet the Omphalos stone was set, called the uh, navel of the world. And as the guy in the middle is thinking he's stroking a navel, you and I actually know for certain that this is not a navel. This is the tip emerging from the earth. And why would that be the center of creation? Because that's the act of reproduction. It's the onk. It's the onk. It's not the navel. Literally in the name. Umphalos. Right. Might as well call it the not a navel stone. Feel free to stroke the not a navel stone. It's a geyser. It goes off every 20 minutes. 
Of course, the pulpit is the male and the female sex organs combined. And you have the same Christ. To think about Christ as as the uh, phallus, and that the merging of the Christ na, Christ plus na na is the divine feminine. That's another word for that. Satisfies the India motif of creation, the Krishna. And Rome doing the same thing as the Na, but wanting to change it up to appear different, calling it the Christos. The Christos. It's important right now that we do a quick little math lesson for some of you. Krishna came before Christ by a thousand years, if not more. Maybe it was 800 years. It's a long, long time. Long time. Does that mean Christianity is not real? No. No. But it does mean you, you can't, you need to remove the originality of it and look at it as a much longer tradition. There's a pun there, James York. There's a much longer tradition there. And that should strengthen your faith, by the way. If you need your faith to be based on the novelty of Christ, you weren't, you weren't listening anyway. You weren't. That's what he, she said. Get it? See, because God is uh, uh, the great He She, so it's like that's what He She said. We'll get to that. That's maybe too, maybe beyond. Iesu is really the birth of Jesus, and this I and you is a very common element. It's part of that idea of placing the phallus inside the ark. Iesu. Before the land of Jays, we had I, Iesu. Yesu, Yesu, Jiso, Jesus, right? Iesu. And what does S mean? It means to flesh, to put into flesh. So basically you have the Jupiter, the, the Iupiter, and the Iuno joined in flesh. Jupiter and Uno joined in flesh. Iesu, Jesus. And you can see Mary in Iuno. You can see the Father of God in Iupiter. It's a beautiful, beautiful amalgamation of the naked phallus of religion growing a costume, becoming refined, dressing itself for public because we have roads now. And these stories are the same. 24 things that both Krishna and Christos did. 24. Number one, virgin birth. Which, by the way, ladies, freaking clever as hell. I know that some of you, many ladies out there, not say more than men, but many ladies have engaged in impropriety where they've uh, said one thing and done another. And the idea of coming up with this virgin birth is just brilliant. It's brilliant. I did not sleep with one any such man. Twas a virgin birth. I woke up this way. It's just brilliant, really. And the fact that guys believed it kind of shows you we had it coming, right? There's another pun there. Number two, godly biological father. Number three, earthly foster dad. Number four, deity in the flesh, right? E.A. Su. This is actually a first, the first. Remember, gods were always God. They were always separate from the world. Jupiter and Juno were not of this earth. They needed to be given flesh, the ES. And inside the flesh of I and you is Jesus. Same with Krishna. These are the fleshening of God. Again, deity and flesh, number four. Number five, one-third of the Trinity, considered one-third of the Trinity. Number six, before I go on, keep in mind, number five, Trinity built into built into Hinduism, not necessarily a novel idea. Number six, angels hailing the birth of both these men. Number seven, a star announced their birth. Number eight, pleasing sounds playing from the sky. Number nine, shepherds attending the birth. Number 10, expensive gifts. Number 11, despite how poor they were. Number 12, both of them were responding to the paying of taxes. Did you know that? Joseph and Mary had come Traveled from afar to pay their taxes. Krishna, um, at his death, was protesting 
the immorality of taxing your life force. But Chris is not our God, so he can just fuck off. Right? Dude was really trying to help. Still is. Number 13. They were both preceded by a forerunner before them. Number 14. A ruler tried to kill that forerunner. Right? John the Baptist on Jesus' side. I can't remember the name of the dude on Chris's side, but he's there. Number 15. Both were considered highly well-learned when they were young. Number 16. Both of them cured leprosy. Number 17. They were both offered the world by some sort of devil figure. Number 18, they were anointed by a poor woman. Number 19, they performed a catering miracle. I don't know why this is so important, but it was. Turns out, one of the things that we look at in a god is his ability to cater events. Uh, so both of them performed a catering miracle. Number 20, they walked upon the water. Both of them did. Number 21, they predicted their own deaths. Number 22, they were both pierced by metal. They were both pierced, pierced intermuscularly. Please hear me. Please hear me. They were both pierced intermuscularly by a metallic object that the state insisted would fix society's problems. Did you hear that? Both Krishna and Christ were inoculated with steel and died. Both of them did that. Both of them rose from the dead again, number 23. Number 24, both of them promised to return on a white horse. Remember this Quetzalcoatl thing we've been talking about? Right? Both of them have this same... Same promise. Which is fascinating. We should do a whole show on that. We already have. Messiah-like saviors. 16 Messiah-like figures who were crucified and ascended into heaven. When I say crucified, what satisfies the definition of crucified here is being nailed to, on, or below... A tree that's either living or dead. Okay, that's what we mean by crucified. Thulis of Egypt, 1700 BC. We should have a drum roll here. The Academy Awards of Crucifixion. Thulis of Egypt, from 1700 BC. Krishna of India, from 1200 BC. Krite, 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 don't, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that. Krite of Chaldea, 1200 BC. Attis of Phrygia, 1170 BC. Tammuz of Syria, 1160. Jesus or Eros, 834 BC. Bali, 725. Indra, 725. Lao, we've heard that name, 622. Buddha, 600 BC. Mithra, 600 BC. Alcesto, 600 BC. Quetzalcoatl, lots of crucifixion going on. Around 600 B.C., but even Quetzalcoatl, Witoba, 552 B.C., Prometheus, our, our buddy himself, getting crucified in 547 B.C., and Quirinus of Rome, 506 B.C., all of them, all of them sharing the ritual of crucifixion. Crucifixion. Things were beginning to change. The worship of the phallus was changing. Why? Because people were being crucified. It's a crucifixion coming. Now, you've been told as a child that the crucifixions were happening because people were uh, persecuting Christians. And, reminder what I said at the beginning of the show, that is actually bullshit. That actually wasn't happening. You're going to see some amazing similarities between Rome and 9-11 here in a few slides. And in order to get you there, I, I, I need to show you how the paganism became Christianity 
and how much fire and death had to occur for the polarity to shift. There's a pol polar shift. This is the monstrance and the pix. This monstrance on the left is basically the female orifice and the male, I mean, the female and the male genitalia poised before penetration. And that if you look at the history of the monstrance, you'll see that, that it becomes less and less obvious as we, as we grow, as we go. And that the pix itself becomes this, uh, what used to be a reproductive symbol of the uterus and, the, and being uh, inseminated by the white wafer was inverted into what we see now as the cross. The punishment of death was meted out also to anyone touching, looking into, or acquiring as to our monstrance and picks. The monstrance being an almond-shaped or dove-shaped vessel representing woman or the membrum feminum, and the picks a rod-like article which lay inside the monstrance or mother. Death was meted out to one of our soldiers by his being hanged, drawn and quartered in sight of the French army for having touched the monstrance and picks before the battle of Agincourt. That the sanctity and the virginity of this thing had been uh, militarized. That once once was religion turned into something more petrified that you and I know now as government. It's regimented belief. And it was changing. In a hundred years, my friends, you could argue even less. In 60 to a hundred years, we went from 4,000 phalluses found in a Roman orgy pit to the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And if you understand that the cross is the phallus, and two stones? Well, look what happened. In the time of pagans, in the time of orgies, the penis was erect. The balls were below. As Rome burned, the cross was inverted. The phallus was inverted. And we became a world not of wanting things, Right? What is an orgy but a giant pit of want being fulfilled? And we turn that into a giant pit of, I shall not want. I shall not want. It was a spiritual eugenics program. And it wasn't an accident. It should be more than ironic to all of us that the same company, Pfizer, that's now pushing a pill after its four vaccines. The same company in charge of our reproduction, our eugenics program, was the same company behind the blue pill. And that that blue pill that made the flaccid erect gave the flaccid belief that that same company would have a massive fall in their profits just in time to initiate what we're seeing now. And if you want to know why and how these crosses inverted, you're seeing the same thing happen now. And why is it happening? Because society needed more roads. It's not that simple, but it's because society Because society needed to change. Now, I don't think society necessarily needs to change, but I'm telling you the egregore of society. We are surrounded by people that insist. First, they insist someone should do something. Second, they insist it's they, not me. It's them. And as long as you're convinced that it's them doing it, you have no problem going out and persecuting them. Even if them is your neighbor, because you've got it all settled now. You know them as them, not us. So you're not persecuting us, you're persecuting them. And this exact same thing is what's happening now. This should be so obvious to us. These guys were making 
$2,000 million a year. Giving you back, giving man back his loins, the same loins that man gave up so long ago to satisfy the quest for Rhodes, the quest for Rome. There was an Egyptian Christ called Serapis. Fascinating character. And you look at Serapis and you think, no, that's Greek, that's Greek, that's Greek. And no, it's not. No, it's not. It's Egyptian. And Serapis is the blending of Osiris and Apis, the bull and God. And what do we do now with our vaccines? They are bull medicine. They are made from the pus of Apis. So this same living uh, ideal is still here today. And it ended up becoming the Jesus that we know now. This is Jesus. This is your Egyptian Christ. Same everything with the story. And a Serapium is a temple or other religious institution dedicated to Serapis. Right? And it's fascinating that after you've been told by your school that, well, the Christians were being persecuted, and by the way, definitely people in Rome were persecuted all the time. And definitely some of them were what you might call rudimentary Christians now. Absolutely. But it was not the will of the state to pick the Christians and torture them and to try and hold up something pagan. It was literally <laughs> the antithesis of what they were doing. That they were actually doing the exact opposite. They were writing the narrative, the same narrative that's been written now about COVID. They were writing then. And people who suffered from long COVID were the persecuted. And people who knew the truth had no ability to compete with the voice on the streets. And that this old secret of Serapis coming from Egypt was a problem for the New World Order. Which is why a Christian mob destroyed the Serapium. They burned it down. And what was really happening was that you had a worldwide cleansing, a worldwide population program enacted. I'm not here to say that the Rome is like, we have too many people, we have to kill everybody. It could be part of that. But I think you're watching a nation collapse on itself and looking for something to blame and decides that it's their piety. That it's their piety. And that it, that, that would sell as long as you could reproduce the literature to insist that. And the only way you could produce the literature to say that is the Serapium has to go. And what was the Serapium? The figurehead of Serapis was at the heart of the Library of Alexandria. It was their symbol. And before 9-11, you and I would say, yeah, it was a tragic accident. All these literature was burned. And the library slowly declined as a result of that, purely because of just the sheer horror and shock of how hard it was with the fire. That we tell each other, yeah, it was 2,996 screaming victims trapped inside that library as it burned and no one had any idea what was going on. And that's not what was happening at all, was it? A narrative was being written. The phallus was being inverted. A new religion was being installed and that we didn't have room for vajayjays and phallusaticals, phallusatical icicles, phallusicles, and phallusicles. We needed something different. And so the first internet, the Library of Alexander, was burned. It was burned. A scriptural exodus took place. So step one, you take from the religion what you need. You take the story of Apis and Osiris and Serapis. 
and you erase it. Step two, you place your new figurehead in its place. And mission accomplished. Wait. Uh, trying to get this guy on the... Here you go, buddy. Here you go. Yeah, good job, Prometheus. Yeah, have a good one. All right. Um, oh, shit, you missed all that. Sorry. You just missed Prometheus getting a nut. Oh, I shouldn't even tell you what you missed. My Bad camera move on my part. Um, shit, now I'm really screwing it up. Give me a sec. Give me a sec. There we go. Let me get this, and then we get this. Yeah. That the first internet was burned down, and the story of Jesus was written in the smoldering ash. And I can prove that in one biblical verse. Not only can I prove in one biblical verse that, that the story of Serapis was rewritten, I can also prove to you that Christians were not persecuted. Remind everyone that Jesus was born in a manger due to a tax issue. But here he is in Romans 13.1. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has establisheth. And the authorities that exist have been established by God. And we went from worshiping phalluses to worshiping state phalluses. Or fallacies. The phallus, the phallus says were fallacies the whole time, right? There's a fallacy in the phallus. I, you cannot point at another verse that has more audacious propaganda than Romans 13.1. It literally contradicts Jesus like two chapters after He's tearing through the temples. This is a Roman story, my friends. And why is it so hard to believe that Rome was a controlled demolition? Why? You've got a scapegoat, Nero. You have the people to blame it on. And before 9-11, maybe many of us couldn't even imagine that Rome would be a controlled demolition. But it was. I know that because I studied the first triumvirate. And there were three triumvirates that we know of. Three different alliances that were formed below or above the law, whichever analogy you prefer. And that the people would rather believe that there was a triumvirate operating behind the scenes, but then they quit because they were like, hey, this operating behind the scenes stuff, why, it's, sure it's helping. Sure we can say one thing to the people and have our own alliance, but it's just wrong. And that we decided back, back when we were finding 4,000 phalluses in an orgy pit, the same people were like, it's wrong for us to have a triumvirate. And that that never happened again when it did. Not only it did, it does, and it will, and it continues. Yes, that's Lady Goo Goo. With five puppet men. What are the parties? But two stones. What is Gaga but the giant phallus? Of course the triumvirates are still in business. Why would they not be? Do you guys remember that story where the triumphants were carried through the streets and burned and punished? Or do you remember the story where they just got really fucking rich and one of them ended up being worshipped as a deity later? <laughs> so what would you do? Would you form an underground conglomerate? Would you tell people that there's these things called countries and they not be there the whole time? James, no one would fall for that. 
The truth is, is that people will believe the year is 1 AD if you apply enough marketing. You couldn't do that. Yeah, I could. If I had enough marketing budget, I could convince the world that it's 1 AD. And I know that because it happened. And you know when it happened? When Rome was under a controlled demolition. That's when it happened. It happened when the, when the penis was inverted. When it happened when the symbolism of, of who we are was vastly changed into who we're going to be. Who we will be now, whether people like it or not. Do you think it's fitting that during this exact same time we started riding backwards? During this exact same time we inverted every single thing about our religious history that we had. A, a, a religious history built on regeneration suddenly changed to a religion built on piety. Right? That's what happened. This symbol was inverted. In broad daylight. And now we have stories that, oh, well, it's the pagans running the world. And it's not the pagans. It's a bunch of people who insist it's they. It's a bunch of people who insist it's them doing this. And the whole time insisting someone should do something. And what about the roads? That's where we are now. This is probably the 19th triumvirate, right? I was thinking of 19th nervous breakdown. Why did he say 19? But it, it's that same triumvirate here, and we call them countries. They all have their little flags. And those little flags all have a book. And what does that book tell you? That book tells you. And no no unspoken or, or vague terms at all that book tells you that everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established the authorities that exist have been established by God so it's a whole new twist on on who was persecuted and why. It's a whole new look at how there's no way a religion based on a monthly orgy where everyone loves each other could have ever survived in a nation that has to insist there's a they and that we need roads and that everything should be predictable. And that the weirdest thing that we ever want to encounter on the street is not Poundalia, right? <laughs> it's a Stuckies. That that's where we're, that's our threshold right now. That's our limit, right? All right, guys, that's all I got for you today. I appreciate you being here. Hope you have a wonderful Friday. I uh, hope that I've given you some things to think about. I believe that uh, Christianity is a, a powerful, potent religion. I actually consider myself uh, a Christian, um, which probably is hard for a lot of people to hear. But I don't actually think that people that are insisting that the English Bible be adhered to are actually reading even the Bible. I think they're reading a, a strange bastardization um, of work that's been uh, coddled and cut down by people like Pfizer, people like Fauci, wrote the Bible that we have now. And I know that because we have the smoldering history that still echoes in our calendar, even today in our calendar, showing you the religious roots the history, the footprints of savior technology and of the Christos, right? And of the Krishna. And that you can uh, accept and embrace those things and not participate in the building of roads 
or the burning of they, or the burning of them, or the piety of I, or this obedience fetish that we have with government. None of those things are necessary or vital to uh, your, your spiritual story. Many of you are hooked on the idea that you need salvation. That before you were born, you were cast into the fire and hung below the sword of Damocles and, and been, been labeled as guilty and evil and that you need saving. And I don't have sympathy for you anymore. I can't. Because you are trying to paint a world where God gave you the most sophisticated technological on-land submarine that's ever been invented with the most detailed and high-resolution graphics and uh, sounding equipment that's ever been known. And you want to sit there and bitch and cut the end of your penis off and get mad because I'm not believing the tax code written in Romans 13.1. I don't feel sorry for you anymore because you're shitting all over the gift that was given to you by insisting that you were put here to burn in hell. I think maybe you want to burn in hell. And I think that's okay too because I have faith that you will find that here in this world. But I will not be able to help you participate in that quest for that red October. It's not going to happen. It's a new Aquarius. And Jesus is Aquarius. Jesus is this idea of the I a su, the I and you made flesh, and that all of us are here crucified. It wasn't just Jesus. All of us are crucified on this tree of life. And it's a good thing, not a bad it's literally how you play in this realm. It's how you log in. It's how you exit the game. So let's stop pretending like being given life and having life difficult is our fault because we're sinners. It's literally retarded as fuck. And you'd be that NPC when you're watching the game who's in the corner just humping the wall. And I don't think God's going to give you credit for humping the wall. It's not... I don't think he is. And I think you know that too. So, have a great weekend. We'll see you guys soon. Hopefully. Got a lot. Got like at least 120 slides here. I'm trying to break them down. But, uh, yeah. Have a great time. We'll, uh, we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.